thanks to all of you for coming on this weekend day. What I hope to do is provide an update on how we are now thinking about treating diabetic macular edema. It has really changed over the last few years. The results I'm going to show you may not all be possible in your hospital or with every patient, but I want to show you these results to provide background to think about your patients when you're treating them. And if you understand this information, it may help understand how to treat these patients now, and as these agents become more accessible in the future. These are my disclosures, and I'm going to talk about how we now think about treating cases of diabetic macular edema, as in this case with reduced visual acuity, which was 2063 in this particular patient. And I want to discuss seven items over the next 30 minutes that we think about. And the first is very important because it talks about why we consider using anti-VEGF instead of laser. Laser is an excellent treatment. We've been doing it since 1986, but we've now learned that if you have access to anti-VEGF therapy, you might want to consider using that instead of laser. Some of the data come from a group of trials that were done by the DRCR network. This is sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, a government-sponsored study in the United States, now involving Canada, and we hope to involve more and more places around the world. The protocols have different letters, and this is from protocol I. This was comparing laser to anti-VEGF therapy. And it took cases like I just showed you and looked at the results at one year, and then followed through two years, and then through five years. With laser, on average, the group shown in purple here, gained vision. And you can see that they gained vision through one year and it remained stable through about two years. The reason we want to consider anti-VEGF therapy is because on average, the improvement was greater. This shows two different strategies of anti-VEGF therapy. In the orange line, the strategy was to use both laser and anti-VEGF therapy. We already knew that laser worked. It was thought maybe both would work the best. And so you can see in orange combining laser when it was first treated with anti-VEGF injections was superior to laser alone. But the light blue line was anti-VEGF alone. It wasn't alone forever. At six months, you could add laser if there was still edema. 60% of the eyes had no edema by six months. 40% still had edema where you would consider adding laser. And what this showed us is you don't have to give laser and anti-VEGF in the beginning. You could delay laser for at least six months and in 60% of the eyes, no laser at all. And you could get as good, if not better, results. And so why give both in the beginning if you just delay laser only to those cases that need it six months or later? The results are as good or possibly better. Similar results were seen using a Flebercept in the Vivid and Vista trials. This also compared a flebercept to laser, with the primary endpoint again at one year and followed through three years. In this study at one year, the top lines are giving anti-VEGF with the flebercept 
And again, on average, the improvement was superior to the improvement seen with laser alone. And that's why if you have access to anti-VEGF therapy, we're very confident across many large randomized trials that the anti-VEGF approach is going to be superior to laser. These results were sustained out to three years. In addition, it was shown that the results were similar whether you gave the agent every four weeks or every eight weeks, but by giving the agent every eight weeks, you gave fewer injections. Now, it wasn't every eight weeks from the start. In the beginning, five monthly injections were given, and then it was given every other month through three years. So this was a way of trying to avoid monthly treatments forever. It didn't avoid treatments completely because there still was treatment given every other month. But still, there were excellent results obtained by starting with five monthly injections and then going every other month through three years. In addition, similar results were shown in an Asian population in the Vivid East study and in the Vivid Japan study, where again, the gains in vision were substantial with anti-VEGF therapy on average when people walked in with diabetic macular edema. So all of these studies convinced us that on average, people will improve more if you give anti-VEGF therapy. The second question of the seven questions I want to present to you is, does it matter which anti-VEGF therapy you give? The first results I showed you were in protocol I of the DRCR network using ranibizumab. The second set of results I showed you were in Vivid and Vista using a Flibercept. In addition, we know that Bevacizumab or Avastin works. So we have a Flibercept or Ilea, we have Bevacizumab or Avastin, and we have ranibizumab or Lucentis. All three anti-VEGF agents work in diabetic macular edema. Does it matter which one you choose? This was looked at in another protocol by the network, Protocol T. In Protocol T, the same regimen was given to eyes that had diabetic macular edema. They were just randomly assigned in 660 eyes to either a Flibercept or bevacizumab, or ranibizumab. Again, on average, all three agents cause gains in vision. But in this randomized trial, where all else was equal, it did appear that the top line, which was a flibercept or ILEA, gave on average superior results to both ranibizumab in yellow and bevacizumab in blue. And these results were sustained out to two years, but these results were not emphasized by the network when we think about treating our patients. Because these results were driven by one subgroup that was planned to look at, and that was the initial visual acuity. We learned that when the initial visual acuity was relatively good, 2032 to 2040, which was about half of the cohort that we studied, on average, all three agents cause improvement. There are two things to take away from that. First of all, there's no ceiling effect. If someone walks in with 2032 or 2040 vision, while that's relatively good, on average, they'll still improve if you consider giving them anti-VEGF therapy. The second thing we learn, not only is there no ceiling effect, but on average, it probably doesn't matter which agent you give. But I showed you on the previous slide that a flibercept was superior to bevacizumab and ranibizumab. That superiority was driven by the other half of the eyes that were enrolled, those that were 20, 50, or worse. And here you can see in the orange line, a flibercept was superior to both ranibizumab in yellow and bevacizumab in blue. If we look at the statistical analysis, we can see that a flibercept was superior to both of them at one year, 
and it was superior to bevacizumab at two years. Looking at the statistical analysis, we can see that we're not confident at two years that a flibercept is superior to ranibizumab. But we don't only look at the results at two years, because remember, at one year, a flibercept is superior to both of them. If indeed somebody was treated at time zero and kept their eyes closed for two years, then the outcome with a flibercept would be similar to the outcome with ranibizumab. But patients don't keep their eyes closed for two years. Through one year, on average, the visual acuity is better with the flibercept than with either bevacizumab or ranibizumab. At two years, we only see a difference with the flibercept and bevacizumab. And so we don't look only at two years. We look at the results over two years. To analyze the results over two years, not just at two years, we do an analysis called the area under the curve. We look at whether the area under the curve is different among the three agents, not just at two years, but over two years. And so here's the area under the curve for bevacizumab. The area under the curve is even larger for ranibizumab and the area under the curve is largest for a flibercept. And we, when we look at that analysis, what we see is that a flibercept area under the curve over two years is superior to both bevacizumab and ranibizumab. And that's why even though a flibercept at two years is only superior to bevacizumab confidently, it may not be superior to ranibizumab at two years. Over two years, we're convinced that a flibercept is superior to both of them. And that's why when the visual acuity is 2050 or worse, we would prefer, if we have access to it, to start with the flibercept. And that's what we learned about which anti-VEGF agent to do. Now, all these results that I've just showed you in comparing agents or comparing laser to anti-VEGF showed you the average gain. The average gain for a group does not tell us if it's a clinically relevant difference. It's a very sensitive way of looking for differences, but it doesn't tell us if it's a clinically relevant difference. To look at clinically relevant differences, we look at secondary outcomes that are planned. For example, looking at the percentage of patients with each of these agents that gain 15 or more letters on the standardized eye charts that are used. Why 15 or more letters? That's three or more lines on these eye charts. And every three lines, the letters double in size. And we have very good data to suggest that that's a real, substantial, clinically relevant difference. And so once we look at the average change, if indeed we see that on average one is better than the other, as a flibercept was better than bevacizumab and ranibizumab over two years, we then look at whether that translates into clinically relevant benefits. And this shows you at one year, that the percentage of eyes that gain 15 or more letters is more likely with a flibercept than either bevacizumab or ranibizumab. So the average change on the previous slides translates into a clinically relevant change shown on this bar graph. Now at two years, we don't see a difference among the three agents for this clinically relevant outcome. But as I said earlier, we don't just look at the results at two years, we look at the results over two years. So if we ask ourselves, over two years, are you more likely to spend more time, 15 or more letters better with one agent than another? The answer is yes. With the Flibercept, we're confident that you're more likely to spend time three or more lines better than with bevacizumab or ranibizumab. With all three agents, though, it's unlikely 
to have worsening of vision. This is worsening by two or more lines from anything. It could be from diabetic macular edema, it could be from cataract, it could be from just a vitreous hemorrhage, and indeed, with all three agents, it's unlikely to lose vision. Another thing we learned was that while you're treating the diabetic macular edema, it could reduce the chance that the diabetic retinopathy severity might worsen. What do we mean by the diabetic retinopathy severity? This is going, for example, from severe non-proliferative retinopathy, perhaps the presence of venous beading in several fields, or the presence of intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, or IRMA, which predict a high risk of going on to proliferative retinopathy. Well, in fact, the risk of worsening is reduced while you're treating the diabetic macular edema. This shows you the percentage of eyes that had non-proliferative retinopathy when they entered protocol T with diabetic macular edema. And over two years, the percent of eyes that are worsening is quite low. It's not zero, but it's quite low. It's seven to 10 percent. Even if we look at the eyes that are at high risk of going on to proliferative retinopathy, typically we would expect anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of these eyes to worsen. We see that while we're treating their diabetic macular edema, the, the risk of worsening is between 7 and 18 percent not 30 to 50 percent. So you get an additional benefit when you're treating the diabetic macular edema. Again, if you have access to this, we prefer to use anti-VEGF. You don't get this benefit by using focal grid laser. If we look at the eyes that started with proliferative retinopathy and had diabetic macular edema, the chance of the proliferative retinopathy worsening is again quite low. It's not zero. By worsening, we mean that you have proliferative retinopathy and over two years, worsening would be that you need additional pan-retinal photocoagulation, or PRP. Worsening might be a vitreous hemorrhage. Worsening might be a traction detachment of the retina. And what you can see here is that with all three agents, there is a risk of worsening. It's relatively low. We would have thought this might be 40% because most of these are vitreous hemorrhage. How about improvement of diabetic retinopathy? We rarely see that as part of the natural course. We don't see improvement typically when you give focal grid laser for diabetic macular edema. But what we learned was that about a third of the eyes when they have non-proliferative retinopathy have improvement of their diabetic retinopathy level at one year, and again at two years. For example, they might go from severe non-proliferative retinopathy to mild non-proliferative retinopathy. Even if we look at this subgroup that were relatively worse, level 47 to 53 means moderate to severe non-proliferative retinopathy. Again, about half of the eyes have improvement in one year, and two years, an extra benefit while you're treating the diabetic macular edema. Also notice there's no difference among the three agents in terms of which will improve. So again, we give a flea recept if we have access to it, mainly because it's more likely to lead to improvement in vision that's clinically relevant. But if we look at eyes that started with proliferative retinopathy and diabetic macular edema, now we see again there's improvement with all three agents, but it's more likely with a flebercept than with bevacizumab in blue or ranibizumab in yellow. And that's not only seen in one year, it's sustained out to two years. I'll emphasize this is important information, but it's weak information because it only involves about 60 eyes total. Now, what's the regimen that we use to get these results? We already heard that in Vivid and Vista, the regimen was to treat with five monthly doses, 
for diabetic macular edema, not macular degeneration, but for diabetic macular edema, and then every other month through three years to get excellent results. Those are excellent, but the DRCR network in protocol I and protocol T was designed to try to also maximize visual acuity, but do it in a way to try and minimize the number of injections and visits rather than every other month for three years, to try to have fewer injections than that, to make it more feasible. What did we find? Well, there are three principles in using this regimen. Number one, start with six monthly injections. That's a lot. That's not very few injections, but it's only in the first six months that a lot of injections are given, as I'll show you in the next few slides. So start with six monthly injections. That's number one of the three principles. The second principle is at six months, withhold the injections unless it's improving. So if it's no longer improving, maybe it's flat and no longer improving on the central subfield thickness on OCT. Or maybe it's still thickened on the central subfield thickness but it's not worsening or improving, it's just stabilized. If it's stabilized, we withhold the injection. That's how we begin to give fewer injections, if it's stable. And the final rule of the three rules is if you withhold it and the thickening starts to worsen, then we resume treatment. Maybe it worsens because it was flat and then it gets thicker. Maybe it worsens because it was already thick and stable and gets even thicker. In that case, we resume injection until it stabilizes. Now why, question number three of our seven, do we start with six monthly doses? Why not three? Why not five? Why six? We start with six because we learned by looking back at cases that were treated with six, we still get improvement with each injection. In other words, after the first injection, when all of these eyes were thickened, only 70% were still thickened. You could stop at that point and be happy that 30% flattened. But we don't want 70% still thickened. After two injections, 60% were still thickened. After three injections, 52%. Should you stop there? Well, we don't think so because after four, five, and six injections, it continued to decrease. Another 20% no longer were thickened between injections three and six. And that's why we say start with six injections. Now, similar information was seen in the Vivid and Vista trial where with each injection through five injections, there continued to be more and more patients that gained five or more letters. Let's go back to protocol T. Again, this is with a Flebercep where with each of the injections, the percentage that still have some thickening goes down through six months so that it's only 30% that are still thickened after six injections. 70% have flattened. This is the result with Bevacizumab. It's not as likely to cause flattening. And the result with Ranibizumab is better than Bevacizumab, not quite as good as with a Flebercep. One other thing to think about when looking at the results with Ranibizumab, this was with 0.3 milligram Ranibizumab because in the United States, both 0.3 and 0.5 milligram ranibizumab are available, and with DME in the RIDE and RISE trials, it was shown that there was no difference with ranibizumab using 0.3 or 0.5. This seems to be confirmed in this study. This is where we used 0.3, and 40% with ranibizumab were still thickened after six months. In protocol I, where we applied six injections of 0.5 milligrams, the same number, 40%, were still thickened after six months. So we don't think there's a difference. We don't think we would have gotten 
better results in protocol T had we used 0.5 instead of 0.3. The fourth question. We talked about using anti-VEGF instead of laser. Why anti-VEGF instead of corticosteroids in phacic patients? Well, in protocol I, we not only compared these top two lines of ranibizumab with prompt or deferred laser in the orange and blue lines, compared to laser alone, the bottom line there in purple, we also had randomly assigned eyes to corticosteroids with laser shown in yellow. Now at first, corticosteroids with laser was superior to laser alone in purple. But then, on average, the visual acuity in this group declined, so it was no better than laser, and by two years, it still was no better than the purple line with laser. So that laser alone was just as good as corticosteroids with laser. Now, most of these patients were faking in the beginning. And you might think, well, maybe it deteriorated because they developed cataract. And maybe you think, that's fine. You can just take the cataract out. That's true. But it isn't true that the vision always improves. This is looking at another protocol of the network, protocol P, where we looked at patients that had cataract and needed cataract surgery while they still had diabetic macular edema. And we gave them everything to try and get rid of the diabetic macular edema. We gave them intravitreous anti-VEGF therapy. We gave them intravitreous corticosteroids. We gave them topical non-steroidal drops, but they still had edema at the time of cataract surgery. And we looked at the results, and what we found was that in the third row there, 30% of the eyes improved by four more lines when we took the cataract out. But the reason we don't like to use corticosteroids in phacic patients is because 30% of the eyes don't improve when you take the cataract out. It just stays as it was with the cataract in there, and 10% actually lose vision from where they walked in when they had the cataract. That's not a good result with cataract surgery. And that's why we want to avoid corticosteroids in vacant patients, because in some of them it will get rid of the edema, but not in all. And in some of the patients where it does not get rid of the edema, they still will develop a cataract. And when you take the cataract out, the vision sometimes will improve, as shown on this slide, but it doesn't always improve. And so you're better off just using anti-VEGF therapy in vacant patients. Question number five of our seven, why consider anti-VEGF even if they're pseudo -vacant? This looks at protocol I by the network, and you can see the two ranibizumab strategies in light blue and in orange. The purple is the laser group, and the yellow is the group assigned to corticosteroids. Now, in this smaller pseudo -vacant group, it appears to do as well as anti-VEGF at two years. However, we still don't recommend corticosteroids for pseudo patients because we followed these patients beyond two years. There's the result at two years, but here's the result with corticosteroids at five years. It's no longer as good as anti-VEGF therapy, those top two lines. And that's why even in pseudo patients, where we expect they're going to live for at least five years, if not longer, it's probably better to begin with anti-VEGF therapy. Let's look at a one, another question about this regimen. This regimen says start with six injections, that's easy. But then it says leave it alone if there's still edema, or leave it alone if it's flat. Most ophthalmologists have no problem with holding injections when the edema is gone. But beyond six months, many ophthalmologists want to keep treating when there's edema that's stable. This regimen said don't keep treating, withhold the injection, so you can try to maximize the visual acuity but minimize the number of injections. The question is, is it okay to withhold the injections beyond six months, unless it worsens when we resume the injection? So why continue this regimen beyond six months 
of withholding injections unless it worsens and then resume. That was based on another analysis of Protocol T that was published in the last six months. It looked at these eyes, whether they got a flebercept in yellow, there were more of them in bevacizumab in blue, or ranibizumab in yellow, it looked at these eyes that were still thickened beyond six months where we said, leave it alone. And it said, what happened to the edema in these eyes where we said, leave it alone? Now, not leave it alone completely. We would resume treatment if it started to thicken. And we gave these eyes one or possibly two sessions of focal grid laser. Remember I said that we withhold laser for at least six months, but if there's still edema, we would consider it. Now, most of the eyes did not get laser. You can see that in the orange for a flebercept, only 30% of the eyes are still thickened. In half of those that are still thickened, or 15% of the 30%, they're 2025 20, or 2020. You may not have to laser those. But the ones that were still thickened and have decreased vision, we consider laser. This is what happens to those eyes that still had edema at six months. This is at six months where they all had edema. These are the ones that had edema that we said, leave alone. When you leave it alone, this shows you that the number of cases that have edema goes down over six months later. And over 18 months later, it continues to decrease. It decreases more with the flebercept than with bevacizumab or ranibizumab. But regardless of which group it was assigned to, leaving the edema alone and only resuming if it worsens, results in the edema continuing to go away in those eyes that were still thickened through six months. What about the visual acuity? This shows you the eyes that were still thickened through two years. They were thickened through six months. We left them alone. We only added injections if it worsened. And yet, there were some eyes that remained thickened through two years. It shows you that on average, their visual acuity is very good. And the percent that gained 10 or more letters is very good, and it's rare to lose 10 or more letters. And that's why we have comfort in leaving the edema alone beyond six months. It's unusual to lose vision, as long as you resume treatment if it starts to worsen in its thickening. And that allows us to maximize the visual acuity and minimize the number of injections, rather than giving it every month, as was done in Ride and Rise, rather than giving it every other month, as was done in Vivid and Vista. In this network regimen, it was given monthly for the first six months, so that's a requirement to get these results, but then withholding it unless it worsens, and only resuming if it worsens. In the eyes that had resolved, their visual acuity results were about the same, about two-thirds improved by 10 or more letters, and it's rare to lose vision. Now the question is, does it really reduce the number of injections? Well, the answer is yes. This is looking at protocol I through five years. And what we see is that the visual acuity on average sustained the gains that were seen in the first six months to one year. But the number of injections kept going down. If we look at the median number of injections in the first six months, it was six. That makes sense because the protocol was to treat monthly in the first six months. In the second six months, a median of only three injections were given. And in the second year, a median of only three injections. So nine injections for the median in the first year. So there's a lot of treatment for these patients. You have to explain to them. It took a long time for them to get edema leading to vision loss. And you want to see them monthly just in the first year. And you want to treat them monthly just in the first six months. But the median in the second six months will be just three injections. The median in the second year, three injections. In the third year, two injections. In the fourth year, the median was one. And in the fifth year, the median was zero. And yet, on average, the visual acuity did not decline. This is very different from macular degeneration, 
where we wouldn't hesitate to withhold injections because they might scar and lose vision permanently. We don't see that in diabetic macular edema. That doesn't mean you can hold off in the beginning. It means you should treat intensely in the beginning, but you might be able to hold off unless it worsens beyond six months. And finally, the last question I want to address is even though very few eyes lose vision once you start with six injections, if you still have edema, should you consider adding corticosteroids to that group? So we looked at cases like this that were still thickened, and we considered, should we add corticosteroids? Would that give us better results? It's a high challenge because they did so well beyond six months. But we looked at this in protocol U of the network. This was just published in November of 2017. We started with 236 eyes that the physician said had an inadequate response. Before we considered adding corticosteroids, we said, why don't you give three more monthly injections? In this case, we were using ranibizumab. After those three additional injections, in fact, a third of the eyes no longer could we consider adding corticosteroids because the edema went away. So one lesson here is if you think you have someone without an adequate response, are you sure you gave them six monthly injections? Or maybe if you didn't, you want to try and do that first. But nevertheless, there still were cases that were still thickened. Now some of the eyes could not enter because they were no longer eligible, but 129 of the original 236 eyes were still thickened with decreased vision beyond these three additional injections. And so those eyes were randomly assigned to either a placebo and to continue the anti-VEGF injections, or they were randomly assigned to corticosteroids and continue the anti-VEGF injections. So we only changed one thing. We added corticosteroids to one of the groups. And indeed, both groups needed six ranibizumab injections because the rule was keep injecting unless they're 20-20 or unless they were flat. These were eyes that were resistant to resolving the edema. And in fact, they still had edema through the next six months. The edema got less on average, but they still had edema. And the eyes assigned to corticosteroids got two corticosteroid injections with Ozurdex. This shows you the eyes that got ranibizumab with sham injection, and on average, they still gained vision, even though they had persistent edema before they entered the study. And by using in the blue line, the continued ranibizumab plus the Ozurdex injection, what you see here is that adding the corticosteroid did not lead to improvement of vision beyond what you got with ranibizumab alone. This looks at the OCT, central subfield thickness on average, and with the ranibizumab and a placebo injection, we can see that, in fact, the OCT thickening continues to decrease over the next six months. It decreases even more when we add corticosteroids, but OCT is a good measure of should we retreat or not. It's not a good measure, is the patient doing well with their vision? So this just shows you side by side. On the left, the visual acuity is no better with or without adding corticosteroids. On the right, the OCT is better, but the visual acuity is no better. So we don't use the OCT to tell us if it's better. Maybe this is why we thought they were doing better with corticosteroids, because we would look at the OCT and it looks better. But it's not just the OCT, it's what's the visual acuity. We did look at several pre-planned subgroups, and what the only one that was of relevance was the pseudophagic eyes. There was no difference in the pseudophagic eyes for the first five months. Only at the sixth month did we see a difference. Now, for people who thought adding corticosteroids is beneficial in pseudophagic eyes, did they really think that it was beneficial right at the beginning? Or did they say, there's no benefit until starting at six months, because that's when the benefit was seen. 
In fact, if you believe that there is a benefit, and there might be for the pseudo-faking patients, you have to also believe on the right-hand side that it might be harmful to add corticosteroids to the phagic patients, because here, the blue line is, are the eyes that got both ranibizumab and corticosteroids. It doesn't do as well as the orange line, which got corticosteroids alone. And yet there are still ocular adverse events. So in summary, these are the seven questions that I want to introduce for you to think about as you treat diabetic macular edema over the next year or two. And these are the answers that we learned. Number one, anti-VEGF should be considered instead of laser if you have access to it. It leads to superior vision results on average. Number two, if you have access to a Flebercept, then if the visual acuity is 20, 50 or worse, on average, the patient's vision will do better over two years with clinically relevant outcomes. Number three, the regimen should start with six monthly injections, just as you would have to tell the patient if they needed dialysis that they have to come in weekly for their dialysis, you need to consider telling these patients, while it took a long time for you to get edema and vision loss, we want to see you for the next six months and give you an injection for the next six months because it's a beneficial treatment, but not forever. Unlike macular degeneration, we can consider withholding beyond six months. Now, even if the patient is phagic or pseudophagic, anti-VEGF appears to be superior. And beyond six months, we learned that you could withhold treatment unless it starts to worsen again. That maximizes the visual acuity while minimizing the number of injections. And on average, there's no benefit to adding corticosteroids in eyes that have persistent edema beyond six months. Leave them alone. Only resume treatment if it starts to worsen. And the benefits for vision and the risk of vision loss will be the same as if you kept trying to treat it. You don't have to keep chasing the edema beyond six months unless it worsens, then you want to resume treatment. And so as you see this case that I showed you in the beginning with 2063 vision, I hope this information will help. We'll answer some questions, any that you might have, as to how to apply it in this region of the world with your patients or whatever didn't make sense. But it was a pleasure to share that with you and show you what we've learned and I look forward to sharing more from the network as we do this in the future. Thank you for doing this again. Xin trân trọng và mình cảm ơn giáo sư tiến sĩ Neil Preston Đại học John Hopkins đã trình bày những quan điểm mới nhất của ERCR Dr. Tôi cho quan điểm của Viện Sức Khỏe Quốc gia Hoa Kỳ nhằm nghiên cứu các bệnh lý và